Good afternoon, everybody. Wow, this is amazing. The audience is just so full. I just can't tell you how happy I am to see each and every one of you here. This is actually our very first nursing leadership noon series, and I'm just so grateful to see the wonderful turnout that we have. As many of you know, I'm uh, Janie Heath. I'm the Dean of the College of Nursing, and on behalf of my partner, Dr. Colleen Schwartz, our Chief Nurse of UK's Magnet Healthcare System, we are just thrilled to see so many of you here. I see students, faculty, staff, alum. I see my distinguished uh, dean colleagues in the community. I see other chief nurses out here that are leaders in the field that have come all the way from Louisville. Thank you so much. It's just so exciting to see this warmth in this audience. So it is really my distinct honor to introduce to you my mentor and friend, Dr. Dory Fontaine. Dory is the dean and Sadie Heath, cabinet professor at the University of Virginia School of Nursing and Associate Chief Nursing Officer at UVA Medical Center. Founder of UVA's Compassionate Care Initiative, Dr. Fontaine has more than 40 years of experience in critical care and trauma nursing care, and is a distinguished, has a distinguished record of leadership at the nation's top nursing schools, including University of Maryland, Georgetown University, and the University of California, San Francisco. She is a tireless champion of healthy work environments, training nurses and physicians together, and creating resilient nurses and healthcare leaders through compassionate care. Dr. Fontaine believes that nurturing resilience, teaching compassion, and augmenting wisdom through mindful leadership will truly transform cultures in clinical and academic settings. Dr. Fontaine is past president of the American Association of Critical Care Nurses and current president of the Virginia Association of Colleges of Nursing. She earned her BSN from Villanova, her Master of Science from the University of Maryland, and her PhD from the Catholic University of America. Inducted as a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing in 1995, she received the presidential citation from the Society of Critical Care Medicine and was honored by Villanova with a medallion for contributions to the profession. In 2012, she received the Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of Maryland. And one of her most proud accolades and accomplishments, she received the Martin Luther King Award for Champion Diversity and Inclusivity at the Health System at the University of Virginia. Please welcome Dory Fontaine. Um, it's so good to see everybody. Uh, my claim to fame is that I'm the one that hired Janie Heath three times. <laughs> and it was not that she couldn't keep a job, it's just that a lot of you might know that her husband's in the military. And so she had a couple of stints up and back, and I hired her at Georgetown, and then I was lucky enough to grab her as my academic dean at the University of Virginia after I was there for a few years. So it, it's, been, it's been a total joy. And she's the one who can tell me, what the heck were you thinking? Which is really helpful to have somebody like that on your team. So the other, uh, and I might as well just put this out there. You heard I went to Villanova. Well, who was number one in basketball for a little bit this year? I think we got knocked <laughs> off. We're nothing like Kentucky, of course. Uh, nothing like it. And Janie had to drive me by that Rupp Arena, which, of course, I've, I've heard of. So congratulations to us all. Maybe we can all be at the big dance in Houston. Wouldn't that be fun? That's what I'll, that's what I'll hope for. Anyway, so um, this title, actually, Janie picked the title, so I've just combined some things that I really, really care about, which are healthy work environments. And I have morphed that in the academic setting as well as clinical into a real 
push for compassionate care and resilience, which I'm finding really plays well. So those are the things I'm going to talk about. And I hope we can have some questions or challenges for sure. So these are just a couple of thoughts as we go through um, an agenda here. And again, I'm really going to frame it up with critical care. Um, because that's what I know, and that's what I've been doing since 1972. <clears throat> I'm a lot older than Janie, um, which is why I can be her mentor. So why is a healthy work environment important to patient care, the care of practitioners, and faculty, staff, students? Okay, so whatever your role here, there's something for you in what it means to create a healthy work environment where all can flourish. What's the current state? I just wanted to show you some data that um, maybe it's great down here. But it's, it's not really great in our health systems across the country. We still have a lot of work to do. And then finally, what does it mean to create resilient practitioners? And this is really all about how do we have a meaningful life? How do we help our students, our very precious students, that struggle so hard to become nurses and physicians, maybe respiratory, and then get out in the workforce and um, develop a broken heart? Um, in many, many ways because they can't do what they feel they were trained to do. So that's been my life's most recent work. So I was president of AACN. I know there's even some colleagues here. I've been at meetings with people. I was president about 10 years, well, actually a little longer. You know, time moves fast. I was president 03 and 04. And right after that, we were, as an association, Critical Care, largest specialty group in the world. We were really worried. We were putting out nurses, okay. But they really weren't staying. They were going, oh, I'm going to kill somebody. This is too hard. Do you know? They were turning themselves into people they didn't like. So we looked at how could we change that work environment so people would get up in the morning and go, can't wait to go. Maybe that's a stretch. All right, but at least <laughs> leave work at 7 at night or 7 a.m. in the morning feeling like, you know, I did the best I could. I had a good day. People, people thanked me, you know. So these are the standards, and I'm going to kind of just run through them quickly. I'll give you a couple of fun examples, but I really want to talk about how we move this into some solutions for some tough times. So the standards are skilled communication, collaboration, decision-making, meaningful recognition, and I'll just run through them quickly and um, give you some highlights. So we say that nurses have to be as proficient in communication skills as they are in Clinical skills, you know, everybody wants to learn how to put a fold, well, maybe not a fold, you learn how to put an IV in. You know, that people come here at 18, 20 years old, and they want to learn all those skills, right? Well, the trick is, how do you talk to the patient and calm the family down while you're doing the skill, right? How do you, how do you learn to be confident and competent so the family members are going to be like, oh, we trust, we trust UK, they're taking great care. It's all about communication. And this is probably, on that list, this is probably the hardest one, to be honest, honest with you. 60% of medical errors are still what? Communication. I mean, this has been out there for a long time. Collabor Oops. Um, I guess I put this in there next. OK, so we've done studies, AACN. Now, when I say we, it was not me personally. Vital Smarts is a big company. They wrote those great books, Crucial Conversations. And so we did partner studies with them. Silence Kills was the first one that we found that most nurses didn't speak up. They watched people make errors. They watched somebody not watch them, and they did not speak up. It was something like 10% that really did speak up. We repeated it five years later with AORN. You know, ORs can be hotbeds of tough stuff, tough collaboration, tough communication. And um, we repeated the study, and we found, like, OK, good news. Now 20% speak up. But that, do you know, how can you have safety and quality if people are intimidated or feel that they can't, they can't speak up? And this was across nurses and physicians. So we knew we had work to do. And this is one of my favorite quotes um, from Martin Luther King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And if safety and quality doesn't matter or if individuals' feelings don't matter, and so I use this to say, even as a dean, what am I being quiet about that I need to speak up about? Now, not in a shrill, annoying way, which, you know, J Janie and I are deans. We can talk about that. You don't mind if I call you Janie, do you? 
you know, we have to look at what we speak up about. But if we're silent, what does silent mean? Assent. Silent means that you agree when somebody's either bad-mouthing a colleague or, or something. If you don't speak up. If you don't speak up in the clinical setting, the data says patients die. So that's why it was called silent skills. So I think we're getting a little better about this, and we actually need to role model it, and it's how we speak up, right, and how we talk to each other and our colleagues. So I say that all the time. You know, I want to be a popular I want to be a popular dean. Does that mean that if I have a faculty member that is not kind to students, that I'm not going to talk to that faculty member because I want them to like me, right? How do we help everybody to be the very best that they can be? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to go be mean to students today. You know, nobody does that. Or work colleagues. But how do we help people be their best selves? And that will get me into that whole resilience part of the talk. So the other one is collaboration, that nurses have to be relentless in pursuing and fostering collaboration. When I was at ACN president, I had the luxury of traveling all over the country. And every hospital, they'd give me tours. They were so proud. And congratulations on being a magnet hospital, Colleen, and all your staff. Um, it is a really big deal. So I was in hospitals that were just magnet, and I was in little, tiny, Mad River Community Hospital, 80 beds in Eureka, California. Has anybody been there? It's like flying into a 7-Eleven, really. <laughs> and that's, it's the only game in town, you know? But then I've been in these really big hospitals. And every hospital, so proud, taking me on the tour. And then at the very end, the nurse manager would say to me, well, everything's perfect, you know, everything's perfect, except for that one cardiac surgeon, or except for that one. No, there was always one. And it was like, it was just cut a pall over everything. And I said, well, you know, you have to address that. That's what collab relentless pursuit. And there's lots of ways to do it that we're not going to spend too much time on. But indeed, you can't just say, oh, that's just the way he is. Or that's, how many of you have heard, oh, that's just the way she is. Eh. Patients and families are at risk. Nurses have to have... Um, Seat at the table. They have to be at the top of the echelons, like Colleen here, like, like Janie, Dean He sits at the table with the other deans, the health science deans, and run operations for the university as well as for clinical. Staffing has to ensure the effective match between patient needs and nurse competencies. When I spent a good bit of time in California in the 2000s, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor, um, he decided what the nurse-patient ratio was, you know. And, and that actually isn't the best, just so you know. And there's a lot of things, a lot of things I like about Arnold. But, you know, and hospitals closed, actually, because they couldn't meet. It was too rigid. But it's the nurse, the charger, it's the, the head nurse. Nurse at the bedside knows how many patients they can have. And maybe it's even three at times. Maybe it's one-to-one. -one. Maybe it's two nurses. Um, for one patient, and you have to have that flexibility. And so to me, the, uh, the absolute, this is how we know we have the right titration of nurse to patient when, what does this picture show? The ability to listen. Does the nurse have enough time to be close to the patient and really listen? That's when you have enough. And, and sometimes that's at risk. Would you agree, Colleen? Sometimes that's a little at risk. Um, but we have to have that as the paramount. How can we give individualized care if we don't have time to find out what's most important to our patients and families? Meaningful recognition. I love all of these standards. And as I'm going through them, you can do a little audit of maybe for the students Units you, you've known and loved at UK that you're going to work and tell Colleen she needs to hire you. Um, and others of you that have been nurses can do an audit of where, where the hospitals were that really were fabulous with some of these standards and where they were maybe lower down. Meaningful recognition, this one, you know, we just can't do enough of it. And that's why I've always valued working with um, Janie because... If celebration isn't her middle name, I don't know what is. I did have to talk to her once about too many exclamation points and things. Um, do you remember that, Janie? Have you told them that story? Yeah. So, you know, there's just, you know, one exclamation point is really enough. See, they know you. They know you. But uh, she just 
lets her enthusiasm go wild. So what is meaningful recognition? I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a mug on Nurses' Day or Nurses' Week. It's not another bag. How many of you have plenty of bags, you know? Um, and, you know, it's so funny. I gave this talk recently to the radiologists at the University of Virginia, and I made that comment about the bag, and then at the end they go, oh, we don't even want to give you this. <laughs> it was radiology, UVA, you know. And I said, oh, I will treasure it. Actually, it was a, um, it turned into a seat to sit at the football stadium. You know, you could sit on it. I said, don't have one of those. Um, so it's fun. But one of the things to think about is how do we recognize people every single day? And my favorite example of this, which I stole from um, probably a nurse at Hopkins, I think it was actually Ski Lauer, um, who said, you know, what if nurses at the change of shift when you're getting report or giving report, you know, that night nurse just worked 12 hours and she's trying to go home and maybe she has little kids to get off to school. What if the day nurse coming on said something like, you know, I always love to follow you because your patients are so well cared for. Now, how do you think that nurse would go home to bed, right? Not driving off the road or anything. Do you know? And do we do those little things? Or do we have sort of unkindness happening at shift report? Well, did you do this? Did you do that? You know, you're trying to talk about the neuro checks and the urine output, and they're going, well, what was the blood pressure? Did you give this med? And did they order? You know, you can watch this happening, right? Um, and it's unkindness. And so I think we need to think about how do we recognize people every single day? Not maybe telling them they do a good job every day, but maybe just saying, oh, I'm so glad you're here, you know? I actually had a boss once um, in San Francisco who every single day when she was zooming through the, through the um, offices, she would stop at my door and just say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Now, I was always there. You know, it was my job to be there. She was the one out traveling around. But it just made me kind of sit up and go, yeah, yeah, I'm glad I'm here too. Now, get all that work done, you know. So I think there's ways that we could recognize each other. And this is the final one. What does it mean to be an authentic leader? That you walk the talk? That you don't just say, I want people to have a good life here, but that you do direct things to make that happen, which you can't do unless you really know what these standards are and how to implement them. So as I move around and as I watch things that are positive in healthcare and things that are really sad, it's so often that sometimes the leadership is not walking the talk. You know, they're telling you to, you know, man up and be cheerful and get the work done, but, you know, you don't always see them treating people well, you know, and policies don't seem to be just and fair. So, all right, so these can be adopted, and I have adopted them, but I'm not going to dwell on it today, just for the academic, the faculty side. So I have turned all of these into what nurse faculty should be doing for meaningful recognition, for collaboration, with our partners, um, and really for how we treat faculty, staff, and students in an academic setting. But today I'm going to broaden it and really talk in a big, and we've published that paper, and it's gotten some nice uh, acclaim, and some of these folks worked with you. Dean Heath, Teresa Carroll, for example, runs our student affairs. So she helped me look at what does it mean to have a healthy work environment in a university setting where well, guess what? We have a lot of things to do in addition to preparing the next generation. And we can have competing tensions if the incentives are not aligned correctly. And at the end of the day, the same communication, collaboration, how we work together, who's at the table, who decides, are, are the same. And actually, I've given this talk in Richmond, Virginia, to a group of bankers, <laughs> believe it or not, because they want to have healthy business leaders. They want to have healthy environment as well. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the status of healthy work environments in America, and it's kind of up and down. Um, and what are some of the real key issues? Well, we still have a lot of moral distress where people go to work and they know the right thing to do. They can't get it done for whatever reason. There's a lot of bullying and violence, lateral violence, which is out there. So I, I never like to stay long on the tough times, but I think we have to acknowledge it. And again, Colleen, I have no clue. Your place looks really good. Um, and hopefully your 
working on anything that could be an issue like this. But the data suggests from the American Nurses Association, our own critical care, that there's still things to work on in nursing. Common in not just ICU nurses, but um, many, OR, ER, there's a lot of burnout. There's post-traumatic stress, which we're talking about not just in our veterans coming home, but now as well in the workforce and moral distress. Nurses who experience burnout, as you'll see here, they have more sick days. They show depression, fatigue. They commit errors. And this is all well documented. Um, I didn't put the sources here, but this is all well documented. And they're more likely to change jobs, which is a nightmare. It costs a lot of money to replace a nurse, to train a nurse, and you want to keep the ones. You want to keep. Now, you also want them to go back to school and get masters and DNPs, et cetera, um, grow in their own career, but um, we really don't want people leaving and leaving the profession. So AACN, over a series of years, has done surveys about the healthy work environment. I just put up one here. Um, it's uh, Ulrich's data, as well as uh, others at AACN. And as you can see here, the work environment, 06, 08, and 2013, and these are thousands and thousands of nurses the work environment actually is not really going in the direction that we want, at least on this one. And some of the others were not positive either. And, and one of the variables that they think really does keep nurses at the bedside, feeling recognized, feeling positive, is the nurse manager. So we're doing a lot of training on leadership. How do we get people to be nurse managers? How do we keep them at the bedside so that they can reach out to others? And I know for the students, here as well, your first job, you're going to want to find somebody who's going to have your best interests at heart. And I'm sure you're doing that as you recruit as well. It is that match. All right, so there is an absolute association between burnout and patient outcomes in this one study. It looked at hospitals with more stressed nurses had higher infection rates, and we're all chasing this now. Um, how to make our hospital the safest hospital in America. That's our tagline. We weren't quite there yet. Um, and how focusing on creating what we're calling resiliency in nurses, focusing on themselves, really is the best way to decrease infections and save, save costs. So I'm only going to mention this because I already did with uh, kind of the horizontal violence. And I don't want to scare people into going into the health system to, for their first job, but you really want to look for a place that says we have zero tolerance for people being disrespectful. We, we have open communications. We try to be transparent. You're really going to want to look for that because these are wonderful authors, um, Pearson and Porath. Uh, one of them is at Georgetown, and they are writing about this a lot. It costs billions and billions of dollars a year in civility in the workplace. People slow down their work effort, and they also have a lot of physical symptoms they don't know how to deal with. Um, and so we really have to address it. Um, and life as a dean and life probably as a chief nurse or any of you that are leaders, it's probably all about um, people. And I remember Kathy Drakeup, my dean at UCF, saying to me, yeah, this dean job, I didn't really know it was going to be so much about people. <laughs> I would just laugh. I said, Kathy, you're, a, you're like a psych nurse. I know. I see Deborah. Deborah um, was one of Kathy's um, mentees. But can you, can you picture her saying that? I didn't know it was going to be all about these people. I was like, Kathy, come on. Anyway, so who burns out and why? Who burns out and why? And then what about the ones who don't? And this will help us get into um, uh, some talk about solutions, which get us into the resilient and the compassionate care part. Um, this is just another study about how um, there's a lot of burnout. Now, again, I picked ICU, but it could be oncology. It could be pediatrics, people that work in those NICUs with the tiny babies. Um, there's a lot of burnout throughout nursing. But there's some highly resilient ones who are less likely to develop burnout. And they have... Um, ability to withstand the pressures. And this is true in our physician colleagues as well. You know, they have moral distress too. Sometimes we think we own all this. You know, this is our stuff. Actually, the collaboration communication would be better across the disciplines if we understood that. And I know here in Kentucky, I think you have a model program for training 
um, nurses and physicians and allied health together, from what I can see. So who's ever in charge of that, kudos to you. I, I looked at it. Um, so they've done studies about, well, how? what about physicians? They have burnout, too. And they found that the resilient strategies include family, friends, mindfulness, which I am going to talk about, personal reflection, useful attitudes, appreciation. One of the wonderful things about the University of Virginia when I went there was they had something called the Appreciative Practice Center. And I was like, wow, this sounds so fabulous. Um, and it really was, using appreciative inquiry as a way of kind of living and communicating being together. So instead of, you know, doing all that constructive criticism, you start out with, well, what's going great here? How are we as a team when we're at our best? You kind of come from a different perspective. This was my favorite medical student the last few years. He just went to Yale. He's a um, resident up there in his second year. He's going to do infectious diseases, and I hope we get him back. He was just fabulous, and he wrote an uh, op-ed piece when he was in his first year at Yale because two physicians, brand new, right out of medical school, one of them leaped to their death um, in New York City and the other one committed suicide within a period of two months, you know, graduating in May, dead in the end of the summer. And they were brand new. And so he wrote, and it was published, um, and he helped us run our interprofessional initiative. And what it said was, who needs support, and how do we give them support? Now, granted, they might have had other issues, okay? We're, we're health care providers, right? We know people struggle. We know they struggle. But what could, what could the nurses on that unit with these young residents and interns, what could they have done maybe to reach out? What could they have possibly done? So anyway, it was very popular. It was picked up. Um, quoted everywhere, and Prane helped us run our interprofessional groups um, at the University of Virginia, and, and he was pretty stunning. So let's move into solutions. I'm about, you know, I've got another 15 minutes here, 20 minutes, before we take some questions. I really want to talk about what are the, what's the solution to creating a healthy work environment? Because you know what? We've been talking about these standards for 11 years, right? Um, and we're not moving as, as quickly. So one of the things I've thought is we really need to focus in some other directions, okay? And the directions that I've seen is how you focus a little bit on yourself, which is not selfish, but it's focusing on yourself so you can shift systems and have action that helps the collective, all right? And this is the world according to me, and you did invite me to speak, so I'm going to tell it to you. <laughs> all right, so this is the story of a surgeon. I've got a couple little stories here. So this is one of our business school um, faculty that wrote this, and I'll tell you this. So this, this story is the surgeon had two routes to the operating room. One took him through a dark hallway filled with empty boxes, the other, more time-consuming route, took him through the main hospital where he passed windows, plants, and co-workers. The latter gave him energy, and the former did not. And if he were your heart doctor, ask yourself, what route would you want him to take to the emergency, to the operating room before he operated on you? Fast and discouraging or slow and uplifting? Isn't that an interesting concept? So this is the part where we're going to start talking about how you're living your life. What are the things you're doing so that you can show up and create a positive environment, not only for yourself internally, but for all around you? So what I've started to do is to really look at, OK, you've got a route to get where you're going. And I can take 10 minutes to get to work walking you know, all through the campus at the University of Virginia, or I can go in the back door of this, what used to be a dumpy girls' dorm that's now the medical school, and of course now it looks a little spiffy, of course. They had money to spend. And I can go through the back there. I can see people. I go through neurology. I go through the professional practice group. I walk past the library. It takes me at least 20 minutes, so it's double. And if I start chatting with people, um, it takes a little longer. But guess what the conversation is? Oh, Dory, I saw your student up on the sixth floor the other day, and she was doing such a great job. 
And then I go, wow, you know, we're putting out pretty good students there. And then I'll walk a little further. I'll see a faculty from the School of Medicine, and they'll say, oh, yeah, well, we're collaborating. We're putting that grant in together. So do you see how I get, I'm, by the time I get to work, to start, you know, meeting people for the next day, I'm kind of in a different space, do you know? Or I can tell people, thank you so much for following up on X, Y, Z, you know? And it's a lot different than what? Going to work like this, you know? So I'm not sure that this works for everybody, but I'm just kind of throwing it out there. We have a new researcher at um, the university in the architecture school who's doing brainwave work and walking through neighborhoods and looking at how your brain waves change to more positive in certain settings. So there is something to do, something here. Now, I can't do it all the time, especially if you're running 10 minutes late, do you know? Um, but truly, it's something to be thinking about. And our business school is doing this work with our physician colleagues at the University of Virginia. So we've started in the last six years the Compassionate Care Initiative, which is what I'm calling it. And it morphed from healthy work environment work into a compassionate initiative, which is really looking at how we create compassionate nurses and leaders for the 21st century. Now, everybody can tell what this is, right? Yoga. So I live right on the lawn. This is my backyard, my front yard at the University of Virginia. It's 50 students live in these tiny rooms. They have fireplace, but no bathroom. And it's an honor to live there in Mr. Jefferson's academical village. And then there's these pavilions, these big homes that faculty, deans, and vice presidents have been invited. So I get to live in one, built in 1822. So we have reunion weekends every June. You might have reunions here. So every June, the whole university has reunion weekend. And about three years ago, they started, you know, they have lots of parties and events and, you know, 20,000 people, I mean, it's huge. So they said, well, we're going to have yoga on the lawn Sunday morning at 8. Well, you know, they were up most of the night, Saturday. So the first year they did this, there were two people in front of my house doing this tired-looking downward dog, you know. And I was like, <laughs> like, what's going on out there? Now, I love yoga, too, but I said, no, I'm not sure this is totally caught on. So then this was last year. Look at that. This is 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. All right? So what I'm saying to you is this whole contemplative practices has really caught on. And actually, Janie, wherever we went for dinner last night was a building that seemed to have a lot of yoga happening in there, too. So contemplative practices, what I'm going to say that we're doing now is really bringing contemplative practices into the undergraduate and graduate curriculum and into the whole health system. So why is compassion and care needed? Well, this is the, the story that I've just been saying, that we're living our life, what? Rushing from one thing to another. We're never present where we are because we're always rushing to the, rushing to the next. Now, I am a trauma ICU nurse. I was at shock trauma for 15 years in Baltimore. I actually know what an emergency is. And I will just tell you, there are no curricular emergencies. All right? <laughs> Can I just tell you that? There are none, zero, okay? I have not met one. The patient is not bleeding. But you would think, my faculty, you would think, oh my, we have to get that plan, so you know. So maybe you have to fix the website, okay? Maybe that's an emergency. But there are really, you know, what's an emergency? People's feelings, right? The way people want to be, okay? So stopping rushing. And my New Year's resolution a couple of years ago was no rushing. And I kind of say that to myself, no rushing. Um, it doesn't always work. So uh, there's a wonderful philosopher and writer, Pico Iyer, who says, the urgency of slowing down. Don't you like that? The urgency. What would we gain if we just slowed down? To listen better, to feel better, you know, nurses don't always realize this, but let's say a med surgeon nurse has five, six patients. She thinks, and he thinks, they don't have no time at the beginning of the shift to go sit, pull a chair up, and look the patient in the eye and say, you know, what's the most important thing I do for you today? This is assuming they're awake and alert. And I know everybody in med surgery now was in ICU when I was practicing. But you would save so much time. Oh, this is the one thing they want. Do you know? This is the one that would help your next whole 11 and a half hours. So our Compassionate Care Initiative 
is to reduce human suffering by cultivating compassionate people and systems. Now, reduce human suffering, that's actually a big goal, isn't it? But you're going to remember it. What is your goal? Reduce human suffering. So, a couple quick definitions. Compassion, experience a trembling or quivering the heart. You know, it's that connection. Empathy, putting yourself in the shoes of another. You know, what must it be like to be, uh, you know, a student who just heard that their mother has cancer and they have to take a test tomorrow? You know, what must that be like? You know, actually, I think faculty are pretty good about those things I found. Um, and we've written a paper on this. Others have, too. Um, I found it's not very hard to get in the Charlottesville. Daily progress is a little, um, very thin paper <laughs> in Charlottesville. But, you know, once you've got an op-ed, I don't care where it is, it's a link and people go to it. So a lot of people have looked at this. And what we're saying, it absolutely could, can be learned. Otherwise, we're in the wrong, we're in the wrong business because there's no litmus test for who's going to be empathic and who's going to be compassionate. But they do find that people, when they start medical school, have a degree of empathy on a standardized test. And when they leave medical school, where do you think the empathy is? Higher or lower? Lower because of what they've, how they've been treated and some role models they've seen. And they kind of adopt, adopt that. I don't know that it's been done in nursing, but you know, the question is, where would we fare if we did that in nursing? So I, I fell into all of this um, mindfulness and compassion when I went to a place called Upaya. It's a Zen Buddhist retreat in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You do an eight-day silent program on being with dying. And you learn how to give better care to patients who are dying by going through this series of exercises. And a, a lot of it was mindfulness-based. This was 2009. I had no clue about any of this. Um, our benefactor sent 10 doctors and nurses, and I've sent 70 people to this program now. I raise the money, and I send people, and they come back completely, completely different and ready to come together around how we can take better care of the dying because what? Caring for the dying is about caring for the living. All right, and you can change the whole system. So that's where I fell into it. And Roshi Joan Halifax, you can see the quote here, she talks about the importance of having a strong back and a soft front. So if you think about that, you have a strong back for the hard work nurses need to do. And it might be lifting, you know, let's be real. Nursing is physical hard work. But how do you have that soft front to be open to whatever, whatever comes and that you can respond? So I was on the stage with the Dalai Lama a couple of years ago. It was um, compassion as a global remedy for health care. And it was the head of pediatrics, head of cardiology, and me. Um, and we just talked with him about the kinds of things we're doing at the University of Virginia. And I told him a story about what we're doing as compassionate nurses in the ER, which I'll share. But part of this whole mindfulness movement is really when you slow down, then you learn to pay attention. And what's the first thing in the nursing process? Assessment, right? And if you can't pay attention, how good is your assessment going to be? And maybe it'll be wrong, actually. You miss things. So at the end of this uh, Dalai Lama, and we were at this uh, Paramount, Paramount Theater, 1,000-seat theater. It was all the community. Charlotte. I mean, people come out for the Dalai Lama, so, which you would imagine, yeah. So there we are on the stage, and at the end, he gives you this white kata. It's a Tibetan tradition. He'll give you this white scarf called a kata. So we were all standing there like, oh, my gosh. And his, uh, he's right next to you, and his eyes are huge. And you just feel, somehow you just feel calm around him, you know? So he's about to give us these katas, and we're all there. And he notices that these two women who were doing sign language. You know how when they have a big public event, you do signing for the hearing impaired? So he notices them, and this is a guy who's paying attention, right? He goes right over to them, and he gives them our scarves. We were there like, well, I hope we get one, you know? <laughs> here we are. But I just said to myself, you know, this is a a person, a monk, leader of Tibet, who talk about paying attention, right? And of course, he had plenty, um, and he gave us ours. But I'll never forget that, that, you know, those 1,000 people and lights, and, and most people, 
you know, they, they're part of like the furniture after a while, aren't they? I don't mean it that way, but you know, people don't notice them. People don't notice them. And they had, they had tears coming down that they were included in this. It was pretty special. And it was a message for me at that event. So mindful revolution, people are really finding mindfulness now and meditation. Not that I'm pushing it, but I wanted to share with you what we're doing for our students to slow them down, telling them it's important to focus on yourself so you can better focus on patients and families and maybe your own family. So we have this resiliency initiative. And we've written about this, too, in the Huffington Post, about what does it mean. Well, resilient practices, meditation, yoga, reflective writing, deep breathing, teaching people to take, take a deep breath, ground through their feet, be calm before you go into that room to do that three-hour dressing change. Hello. Um, it can make for happier, stronger, more centered clinicians. So this is what we're teaching. And this is the story I told the Dalai Lama. So this is Jonathan Bartels. He is an ER nurse. He's now into palliative care. It's amazing how many people are shifting from ICU, ER to palliative care. He has tattoos. He's from Buffalo. I used to think he was a little rough around the edges. But you know what? Patients adore him. And he and I went to Upaya together. And when he came back, he decided that people in his ER were really heartbroken and had a lot of sadness, a lot of moral distress. He talked about um, a seven-year-old that would come in hit by a car. They would do everything they could, couldn't save, save her. Um, and people with the team would rip off their gloves and do what? Go in the hallway. And who's in the hallway? Another 37 patients, right? I'm sure it's true here. So he decided that he would reach out to his colleagues and do something caring. And that was to create a 45-second pause. So you just stop. Docs, nurses, chap, who's ever in the room. Sometimes it's the family member if it was a long code. Bring people together and 45 seconds to just honor that patient who maybe nobody knew. Usually nobody knew, right? And honor the good work that the team did. 45 seconds. Now, it's not religious, but you know, if you want to say a Hail Mary, knock yourself out. Doesn't matter. Um, it is not religious. We are a state university. But uh, it has really caught on. Um, he has a bachelor's in science, but I said, Jonathan, I'm talking about this all over the country. The Dalai Lama liked this. And um, of course, he was trying to teach me how to breathe. <laughs> it was very funny. But um, it has caught on, and I encouraged Jonathan. I said, you have got to write this up. And so now I'm going all over, and people are talking about it. I was just in Orlando Health, eight hospitals, and they had a room full of oncology nurses and others that were talking about the pause, the power of the pause, chaplains, family. So I'm encouraging you to take a look at that, February 2014. So we can all take a purposeful pause. You're either a leader now or you will be. And you need to think about, can some of these things help you be more engaged in focus, clarity, creativity, so that you can be your best self? Everybody wants to be their best self. So we also talk about the need for kindness. Now, I have a new executive vice president for health. I know you have a good one here. I'm very happy to hear that. I have a good one, too. And he wanted, you know, be safe. We have to be safe. We have to be safe. And I'm like, you know, we're not going to have a safe environment until we have the be nice environment. They didn't like that much. But I knew I was right. People have got to treat each other well before they're going to trust each other. So one of the individuals that has done a nice job on this is Colin Powell. And he has a section in his book which talks about kindness, which is pretty amazing. And what he says is one day he was at the State Department and he got a little restless. I don't know that he shook off his handlers, but he went down to the parking garage and was walking around. And then he went up to the front gates where the people come in and he started talking. And these are minimum wage people, probably immigrants. Um, and he started talking to them and said, you know, I, I never can understand. There's not enough places to park. Cars are everywhere. Um, and how do you decide who gets to get out first? And they looked at him and said, well, Mr. Secretary, here's how it goes. If you come in in the morning and you know our name and you say hello, you're going to be getting out first. <laughs> <laughs> 
Isn't that funny? So you always wondered how that worked, didn't you? And if you come in and don't give us eye contact and drive right by, you're going to be waiting a really long time for your car. Isn't that interesting? Now, this is you know, the way the world works. But if you talk to HR departments and employee assistants, they'll say most of the grievances in the world are around the hello factor. Somebody didn't say hello. And then you go, they don't like me. They're really mad. I don't like them. You know, it just, it just escalates. So there's something in this. So our initiative is all about creating awareness, presence, resilience. This is just a quick definition of mindfulness. How do we relate to others, the world around us? It's really about being open and curious. That's why I'm having such a great time here, asking people questions. You know, what's it like? How it could be better? You know, just, have, just being open and not prejudging anything. Unconditional love. I mean, that's what this picture is, isn't it? Or it looks like Janie and her dog, because that's what they're doing all the time. You know, that's why we love pets, right? Unconditional love. What if we treated people around us like this, patients and families? Not that you're too busy, but that you have plenty of time. So what we're teaching people is that, you know, life is stressful. It's sort of like these... Uh, rough seas, and I am a sailor, but I am a fair weather sailor. We have a sailboat in Annapolis. I like to make the turkey sandwiches and open the champagne. That's how I like to sail. <laughs> I'm not like, oh, you know, pulling in the sheets. I can do it, but. So what we use sailing, we use the analogy here is like, if you think about taking a deep breath, we're always telling others to take a deep breath. Well, what if we took a deep breath and you think of your breath as an anchor you take a deep breath, you ground through your feet, and no matter how rough the seas are, it's calm. So we're teaching our students when they're gelling their hands, washing their hands, that's when they're, you know, I'm good enough, I can do this, you know. Take, you know, put things behind you. And you gel, you know, you gel your hands about 300 times a day if anybody's counting. So there's a lot of opportunities to do this and become a mindful practitioner, which the research like this study has shown that it's higher patient satisfaction. And that's actually the holy grail, right? Isn't that what everybody's chasing? Well, what if tips like this, resilient practitioners, could help us be better? And here's just some, it's really about attention, it's about being fully present, and it's creating stress resilience. This is our whole resilience initiative. We're creating practitioners that can withstand the pressures of the environment. And that's what our whole initiative is about. Healthy and happy. We talk about creating healthy and happy nurses and physicians. We have integrated across nursing and medicine. I've built two I've built a resilience room where we do meditation. I've built a mindfulness classroom with 40 yoga mats. We offer free yoga, tai chi, meditation five days a week. And we have multiple classes. We take everybody on a retreat out to a beautiful farm. It's a clinical day where we're teaching them mindfulness, mindful eating, walking, and we have compassionate care ambassadors in 26 inpatient units doing projects in each of their units. This is an example of what we're doing. Now, my faculty didn't totally agree with it initially, like, what are you doing? It's a picnic. I'd say, no, it's actually not. Um, and now they've come 180 degrees. They also thought I was pushing religion, that this was more like religion, which it isn't. Um, there's a contemplative practice piece to almost every, to the world's religions. Um, and we focus on reflective writing as well. And Cinda Rushton, who is one of your stellar alums, she was part of my um, initial initiative on this, and she helped me look at how could we really transform. You know, how could this be different? Can we really have a compassionate system with integrating this? We've partnered with NPR, and I'm telling you, it's not cheap, but we've created a Resilient Nurses series. You can listen to the first two episodes. It's in six of the top ten stations. There's been thousands and thousands of downloads. We're going to be doing this for three years. So UVA and NPR are partnered together on creating resilient nurses that will stay in the workforce. So inviting stillness and inquiry will make us better practitioners no matter what 
we practice, and it will also help our patients and families. Now, I'm not even going to talk to you about interprofessional education because you're doing that here, but we're having a lot of success um, having people do this together. In fact, the medical students before an exam, they're the biggest ones that are coming over to our meditation group, 12, 15 to 1 on Monday. I was like, what are you guys doing here? Well, we have a test. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Never too late. Never too late to start. You know. So I'll end here because I'm almost at it. I don't want to go over, um, but I would love to have you ask me a question. So my son, you know, I got recruited to UCSF by Kathy Drake up when I was the dean at Georgetown, the academic dean, and um, I loved it there. It was great. My son went kicking and screaming, 11 years old. He, he couldn't figure out what this San Francisco thing was, but then he, got, he bought a guitar in Haight-Ashbury, and he was in a little rock band. He figured out San Francisco. So... His senior year in high school, they were 17, he had a favorite English professor that said, is it okay if I tell this story? He had a favorite English professor who said, all right, here's the three C's for going to college. You know, they'd all gotten in school and, you know, they were leaving, leaving the nest of this great little high school. And the, and the, the three C's were, first, you got to go to class. Good advice. Don't do cocaine, second one. <laughs> And the third one was use a condom. Now, this is a little Catholic school. So the kids go and tell the parents, oh, guess what Mr. Castro said? But, you know, the parents got over it and said, eh, it's probably actually pretty good advice for these kids, <laughs> for these kids. So what I have turned it into is three C's for cultivating a pause in your life and creating resiliency. And the first one is just consider a contemplative practice. You know, that's all we're doing with our students and faculty. We're just saying we invite you. It's an invitation. I think it's actually malpractice to run through a four-year curriculum and not invite people to think about a way to be. It's not all about doing. It's about how to be. So there's lots of different practices. Carve out time for gratitude. Think of three things. You know, you could have the awfulest day, but there were three things that happened. And maybe in someone else's three things, one of them would be something you did, right? That you said, oh, I really like the way you did that. Takes, what, about eight seconds to say that to somebody? And the third one is cultivate a practice of kindness towards yourself and others. You know, forgive yourself. Okay, so you screwed up. You, you know, move on. Don't be beating yourself up. Don't be waking up at 2 a.m. going, I can't believe I don't. You know, just move on. And then say you're sorry you know, and move on. So I want to thank you so much for listening to me. Um, it's been an honor to be here. And if there's like a, a question or two, I'm more than happy to take it. And I realize it's 1 o'clock. But thank you so much for having me here. And this is actually... You know, this is actually the way you have a healthy work environment, is to focus on creating resiliency in others. So any challenges? Any, you know, you don't know what you're, t in Australia they'd say, well, you don't know what you're bloody talking about. <laughs> you know? Deborah, and I'll repeat the question. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. You know, we've all who've been in you know, healthcare forever and yeah. seen, you know, emphasis on certain things come and go. Yeah, and so yeah. Sometimes come and go really suddenly. Yeah. So how do you sort of mm -hmm. maintain the sorts of things you were talking about with mm -hmm. that potential to really just dismiss an entire, yeah. you know, leadership right. stuff? Well, I think I've found something um, that's, that's going to last because I've been watching. The question was, how do you... How do you maintain an initiative when leaders come and go? Is that, yeah. So what I found is that um, if you focus on a healthy work environment, which, which critical care started, but other groups had done, it's actually what everybody wants. It's what everybody wants. And I have just taken it and morphed it into compassionate care and focus on the individual systems and community. And I have watched it really catch on to the point what I didn't share was we have 11 schools at the University of Virginia. Well, architect, 
are involved, engineers are involved. My resilience classrooms are packed all the time. So there's a real yearning for this that um, I would be really surprised if all of a sudden the University of Virginia went away from it. And in fact, we have somebody who just gave us $15 million for a contemplative science center that cuts across the university. So I am with people from the law school and the business school, the MBA. You know, MBAs are a little scared about what they're going out to. You know, it's kind of the human condition. So it really started out in medicine and nursing. Um, and they just had a board meeting over the weekend. They invited us to come, and someone's giving me, um, you know, $600,000 to study. If you create resilient nurses, what happens to their brain, and will this last? And then what happens to patient care? So we have to do the studies. But I, I'm not thinking this is a flash in the pan, do you know? But I, I think it's a good question. Um, we have a new health system uh, leader. We have a new dean of medicine who is actually wanting to kick up the professional behaviors of how people work together. And these are all, I think I have the treatment. I have the intervention. Um, and, and I wasn't listened to a lot in the beginning, but now they're deciding they cannot have a safe environment without this as the grounding. So now they're going to call it, guess what, the Be Wise Initiative. This is all about creating wise practitioners and leaders. So thank you for the question. Long answer, maybe. Anybody else? Well, again, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, go Kentucky, right? Go Blue.